I also am interested if you have any, if we have any good reason to think that the Exodus happened, because often, yeah, I, I've heard a lot of defense of the historicity of the New Testament, the reliability that we can compare and contrast and see that there's very few discrepancies. Yeah. But what do you say when someone says, we've got really good evidence to think the Exodus never occurred? It's just, it's a nice yeah. fairy tale. It's a myth of a, of a people, but it's not yeah. something that happened. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, uh, okay, first of all, you're not going to get direct evidence of that because the Egyptians were masters of propaganda. Uh, so they never record any defeats or anything that goes wrong. <laughs> okay. So Good it's kind of like, uh, yeah. you know, kind of like our newspapers, okay. you know, <laughs> it's like the New York times, yeah. you know, uh, it just, uh, it's very, uh, ideological. Um, so that's, that's how, um, Egyptian historiography was. So you would not expect that, um, a story of a massive defeat of one mm. of the pharaohs, say Ramses the second or something like that, where he lost a major part of his workforce, uh, you know, and was defeated by a foreign God. That's never going to be recorded in Egyptian annals. So you can just forget like having direct attestation from the Egyptians. Um, now, what you can look for, though, is is indirect evidence of authenticity. And um, what what I find really compelling about uh, the Exodus accounts is, in particular, um, the account of the building of the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness. And uh, what I find so fascinating about that is that uh, when you look at the, how the tabernacle is built, it uh, it strongly resembles the um, uh, the Egyptian war tent of the pharaohs like Ramses II. And these pharaohs were gods. And when they would go on campaign up into Canaan, for example, uh, they would reside in these big courtyards that were uh, ringed around by curtains. And they would have like a tent in the middle. And this tent would have an outer court and an inner court. And the pharaoh would sit enthroned on the inner court on a throne with two cherubim on either side. Wow. Now, we have pictures of this. We have, you know, uh, you know, ancient engravings of what these war tents look like. And the dimensions, the layout, it all resembles very... Uh, very similar to the layout of the tabernacle in um, in the books of uh, Exodus and, and thereafter. And what's so interesting about that, Matt, is that it's been popular ever since, you know, the middle of the 1800s to suggest that the Pentateuch was actually written in the time of Ezra, mm. you know, like a thousand years after the events that it records, and it's all fictitious. Well, if it's being written in the time of Ezra, how is it that it matches up so well with uh, Egyptian cultural realia, of that time of, um, you know, the, the new, what we call the new kingdom period, which is often suggested as we're talking about like the 13th century BC, the 1200s BC, the time, you know, around Ramses the second and before, and a little bit after within that time period, this is often suggested as the time of the Exodus. And in fact, the, like the technology and, uh, the, the cultural forms that are described in the Exodus resemble that time period in Egypt. In fact, in King Tut's tomb, we have something that looks like the Ark of the Covenant. We have this mm. big gold box on poles, only on top, it's got a figure of the god Anubis, this, uh, you know, like jackal-like god, or it's like dog god. And, um, but, but anybody biblically literate looks at it like, wow, that looks like the Ark of the Covenant with a pagan god on top. And so what is going on? What, what I would argue, Matt, is that when Moses leads the people out of Egypt, he uses, you know, some cultural forms and um, some cultural technology, you know, even like the shape of different vessels and chairs and tents and so on like that, that they're familiar with because they built these things for Pharaoh. But Moses tells a radically <clears throat> different uh, theological message with this material. So the Egyptians had this kind of sacred tent of Pharaoh, their, their God King, when they went out on war. Well, the Israelites go out into the desert uh, and they organize themselves as an army too, as we see in say Numbers ten. They're on the they're doing make war, waging the battle the the battles of the Lord, and uh, but they have a tent. And in the sacred uh, throne room of the tabernacle, you have the two cherubim that are signs of divinity, and and of royalty, but no idol, hmm. no image. This is the unseen God. This is the God that cannot be represented by animals or human form or whatever. And so we're using, you know, and, and this makes sense to me, Matt, because, you know, you would, you would want to use language and cultural forms that these mm -hmm. 
Egyptian slaves could understand. So you want to use something that communicates just like we want to, you know, we, you know, we use the form of the podcast, whatever, you know, to communicate mm-hmm. to our contemporaries. Right. So you want to use cultural forms that communicate, but you want to say something radically different uh, than, than what was said with them previously. And I think that's what we see in, in the Exodus. So that kind of indirect evidence, again, that to me is, is very strong that, yeah, this is being composed. This is, this is reflecting the historical reality of the time period that it's uh, that it's describing. So indirect evidence feels more compelling because it's it's accidental evidence. It seems as it were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Um, you know, the, the the big stuff can be faked. If, it, if there was just some names dropped mm. in the book of Exodus, well, you know, you could say, well, some fiction writer looked up in a history book and found some names of some pharaohs to drop. But but when it's embedded into, as it were, the culture of the Pentateuch, that's even stronger. And then you, then, uh, then too, we have from the, from the Egyptian second temple, uh, excuse, excuse me, from the Egyptian new kingdom period, we also have a whole bunch of uh, treaty documents, covenant documents uh, between say the Pharaoh and the King of, uh, of Hatti land or the Hittite empire, which we would know as Asia minor. So these were major empires that kind of intersected in, in what's now Israel. They kind of had a border there. And so they, they made uh, treaties back and forth with one another. And the fascinating thing about these treaty covenants that we, that we've, that we've discovered, and we have several of them, they're, they're written in Egyptian and there, there's a copy in Hittite, you know, and, and uh, in, in, in also in the, international language at that time, which was Akkadian, and you don't want to go on to all that and get down on a rabbit trail, but different languages these these covenants are preserved in, and the structure of them looks like the book of Deuteronomy, hmm. with an introduction and then kind of a historical prologue about the past history of the covenant parties, and then we get into some major like constitutional principles, and then we get into a whole bunch of very specific laws, and then we end with instructions about how to store the treaty document and how often it should be read publicly, and a, a list of blessings for following the covenant and curses for breaking the covenant. Boom, 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 boom. This has been known for uh, boy, since the 1950s, at least, um, this material, you know, has come out. It's like, dang, the book of Deuteronomy is following this covenant treaty formula, uh, uh, format that we can attest to the time period that many have proposed as the time period of the Exodus. And what do we know about Moses? Well, he was raised in the Egyptian royal court where they were sending these documents. This is like, mm. you know, political, you know, international politics with the in, international political treaties that were passing back and forth. And Moses, if he was raised in the court of Pharaoh, would have been trained to read these languages and read these political documents and be familiar with them and how to engage in, you know, international diplomacy. So, you know, Moses would be a natural person to be able to write such a document, not between two great foreign kings, but between the king of creation, God himself, and his covenant people. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.